Thanks, everyone. And I was told I had 15 minutes, so I'm going to go over time already, but uh, you'll have to forgive me for that. <laughs> So just a very quick introduction, we'll just make sure that the slide moves forward. Any second now. It is really off-putting having your giant head up there. Is that going to, if I keep clicking? Nope. Back. And back. All right. There we go. So uh, just a very quick introduction, sorry about that, for those in the room who aren't aware of the Australian Farm Institute, where I was the general manager when I accepted this invitation, and I am now the executive director. Um, the Australian Farm Institute is an independent think tank looking at policy issues which impact the economic and social well-being of Australia's farmers, and its purpose is to ensure the long-term viability of the Australian agricultural industry, and it is our 20th year of operations. So today I'm talking to you about ESG aligned sustainability reporting, specifically about the Australian Ag Sustainability Framework, as Gillian's mentioned. So you've heard a lot of information today. I'm going to give you a very, very quick refresh, just so you can get your mind back on this particular topic when you're trying to hold all those different topics in your head as well. ESG is a term which is normally applied to reporting, uh, usually focused on investment appetite and on regulatory compliance. I'm a little too short to see what's going on down there. I'll just stand up. There we go. So those are the kind of things when you're talking about ESG. I'm going to do this. That's more sensible, isn't it? Um, when you're thinking about ESG, that's kind of the frame of reference that we're talking about there. Sustainability is different. People use sustainability in a lot of different ways. It's overused, it has lost a lot of its meaning. Uh, it can be applied in different contexts and those things sometimes are applied in ways that make it sound like it's a, it's a marketing attribute or it's a premium add-on thing that you should do in addition to the rest of your farming. It is not those things. It is not marketing jargon. It's about making sure that we have sustainable farming businesses that are here for the long haul, about making sure you've got continued stewardship of the resources, the many, many different resources that you have to manage, so that we are farming not just for today, but for future generations to come. So, putting these things into context, we're going to take a very high level view, and then we will drill down into the framework itself, I promise you. Looking at the six different capitals to put natural capital into context, because that's a lot of what we're talking about when we talk about sustainability, but it's not the only thing. We all know when we're talking about reporting what our financial commitments are, and most of us have got a pretty good idea on um, our manufactured capital as well. We understand what that means. It's our plant, that's our property and equipment. But you've got to really think as well about how you're using human capital in your farming businesses, how you're using intellectual and social and relationship capital as well, and of course the natural capital in which we all draw from in order to be farmers. So the, the six capitals as explained here are part of the integrated reporting system and this is where a lot of the rise of that ESG language comes from because we've historically had a very strong focus on the financial and the manufactured capital and only recently have we started to focus more on what are sometimes called softer attributes but are really actually pivotal, those human capital aspects, social and relationship capital, intellectual and of course natural capital. So now I've got a really busy diagram to bamboozle you with, but this is important because, again, it helps us focus on things we've historically overlooked. If you think about those capitals as being inputs into your business, so the stuff in the middle, if you imagine that's your organisation, it's your business, this applies to anything, whether you're a non-profit think tank, whether you're a cattle producer, whether you're an LLS, all of these things apply to your organisation and the way you do business. You draw down on each of these different capitals in order, those are your inputs, in order to create the activities you need to get stuff done, which create outputs, which might be in your case commodities, and those outputs lead to outcomes, because just an output by itself is meaningless, there's no point saying, look, I've grown some grain, if that doesn't then translate into an outcome, which is that you've sold it and you've got some market return for it. Importantly, though, you've got to think not only are you using those inputs to make those outputs and outcomes, but then how are you reinvesting back on the other side of this diagram here to make sure that what you take out of your human capital pool as an input is then reinvested on the other side so you can reuse it and the cycle keeps turning around. So it's about how we create value over time and to be able to pick out where we might be eroding value over time as well. Um, now, there's been a lot of talk, not just today, but just generally in the economy at large, about um, pricing and costs and monetizing these kind of outcomes that we're talking about. That's an important output of the processes, but we need to focus on outcomes 
about deciding what it is that our society values and where we're attaching that value and how we can measure that. And that's what these kind of reporting systems are about. So just keeping that very clear in your mind as well. Price is one thing. Value is quite different and can be quite broad. All right, now we get to the framework. The AASF is an outcomes approach to ESG aligned sustainability reporting. So my first task, again, still taking a high level view in trying to explain what the AASF is, is explaining why we've taken an outcomes based approach, because that's a globally unique thing to do. Most sustainability frameworks start with what you know about what's going on, the, the individual things that you can measure, and then they build up a picture. And this is the only framework in the world that is A, country specific, or it was the first one in the world, there's others now, country specific to agriculture and takes a shared values approach. Another high level diagram, I do love my diagrams. There has been a lot of activity and discussion in sustainability in agri-food systems on what we do, on measuring sustainability and what's largely been missing is the why and the how. So the focus on the what, the things that keep you busy every day is, is a very natural response. It's an analytical response that comes from that part of your brain that's trying to logically understand what we need to do to get to the next task. But what happens when you focus only on the what, or specifically on the what, is that it can lead to then a focus on prescribed practices for sustainability. And that runs the risk of constraining innovation and excluding other uh, practice adoption. and uh, can create barriers in markets. And so by prescribed practices, an example would be in the EU when they set a goal of 25% of organic production within a certain number of years. They weren't looking about whether or not they were creating sustainable agri-food systems. They decided, they made a values call that organic was more sustainable and they set a target for organic production without considering what the perverse outcomes of that might be. And they didn't actually set a goal that says we want to be more sustainable by doing this. They just said we want to do this and they've actually ended up in a world of pain because of it and caused problems in their markets as well. So those sort of targets go to that analytical section. Um, the limbic brain, some high level terms for you there, is where trust and instinct live. And most of the choices that we make feel rational, but they really come from more of that limbic brain, that instinctive response to things. And this is why the AASF is taking an outcomes-based approach, because your responses tend to be motivated more by what you feel than what you know. So examples of this would include why people buy designer handbags instead of just carrying their keys around in a shopping bag. It um, also would explain why people vote in a particular way, even if they disagree with a particular candidate or a particular issue, they vote sometimes against their own logical response. And it even explains to some degree why people continue to farm when there are arguably much easier ways of making a living. <laughs> All of these different kind of responses speak to values-driven choices. It doesn't mean that logic and analysis is removed from the picture, but it means the ultimate driver behind why you've made that choice is a values response. So how does all that relate to sustainability reporting? It's because it's a really, really messy, confusing space. If you try to approach it analytically, you get overwhelmed very, very quickly. Um, it is a crowded, crowded space. There's a whole lot of different trade-offs involved. There's ambiguity involved in what kind of actions are important and where your priorities would lie. There's all these interconnections, not only within agricultural systems, but across the economy. And sometimes if you make a bad choice, you can get a perverse outcome. When you're trying to be sustainable, you can end up actually making things a little worse. And so when you're talking about focusing on these kinds of things, the analytic response gets overwhelmed. People get choice overload. They get decision fatigue and they just switch off and they don't engage. Um, there's other things involved in like uh, status quo bias and zero risk bias where we're really busy making all these different choices every day. When we're faced with things like this that look busy and confusing, we just say, that sounds like somebody else's problem. I'll leave you to it. And that's why some of these sustainability frameworks don't get taken up and don't succeed. So here's where the sustainability framework comes in. This is not really the why of why we want to be sustainable. This is a what, this is the product end of the scale. This is a, a guidance framework that helps us just decide communally and collectively what is important to focus on. It's funded, by the way, by the Department of Agriculture and it's managed by the National Farmers Federation. Australian Farm Institute is one of a, a series of 
um, service providers to the project. So we've written the framework itself, but there's a lot of other organisations that are involved in looking at data ecosystems and communities of practice and making sure that this is not just words on a paper, but it's something that can come to life and be meaningful for the community. Uh, that's just the same thing, I think, with different level of detail. So, the how, where all of this belongs. The what is the framework itself. The process, how it all works, is that it lives in this giant ecosystem of other sustainability initiatives. And this is not necessarily the best diagram. It's an older one that I just kind of cribbed together at the last minute. So, if you're screenshotting it, <laughs> don't, don't ask me questions later about why a logo is missing. But it shows you that it lives within this ecosystem where there are a lot of different commodity frameworks and initiatives already underway. And we're going to hear from a couple of those people coming up next as well in more detail. That there's farmers undertaking different certification or compliance programs as well who are feeding into their commodity frameworks, but also into natural resource management and other initiatives. We've got pressures coming from global sustainability reporting standards, also from the finance sector. There's more ESG reporting coming in that's mandatory from later in this year. And all of these things together feed into the high level shared values that the Australian Ag Sustainability Framework articulate. And in return, the framework itself can feed back to some of those things about how the Australian context is putting these things into play. So the why, why this is important, has been um, explained back to me and even actually explained by me in a number of very different ways. And these might include things like it's a communications tool. This framework helps us communicate better with our stakeholders. Other people say it's about facilitating trade. This is the purpose of the framework. It helps us to, to deal more easily with our overseas markets or even domestic markets. Uh, we heard earlier about the Sustainable Finance Initiative and this kind of thing can help us access finance by demonstrating alignment with these kinds of principles. It can help us instill consumer confidence in people by again clearly articulating and communicating the goals that we're, we're striving for. And that in turn can bolster our social license, which we know is absolutely vital for us to continue to farm. It can help us build political capital by demonstrating that the industry is clearly ahead of policy on a whole lot of issues here and showing our openness to discussion. And it can help to harmonise efforts across all of the different initiatives that are underway across Australian agriculture. But none of those things are the reason the framework exists. All of those things are outcomes that the AASF can lead to. The purpose of the framework, the why this is in place, is that it's here to help future-proof Australian agriculture. Now that sounds really bold and, and audacious, but if your, fo your focus of why you're doing this is so you can communicate better, that's a bit of a dead end. It's limited. If your focus is on, I want to be sustainable because I want to make sure my farm is still here for generations to come and I'm leaving things better than I found them, that's the purpose and these other things will come out as outcomes. So I'll take you on a very short deep dive because I don't want to take all of the time on what the framework actually looks like. You've got, um, I know you can't read any of those words, but I'm going to go through them in a bit more detail. 17 high level principles and under those principles or ideal states, we've got conditions that you need to meet to reach those states and then we're developing uh, indicators or measurable um, states, I guess, on what you would need to measure. But if you look in detail at um, principle five, biodiverse ecological communities are protected and enhanced. That's a clear statement that has resonance to Australian producers. It also has resonance in global markets and it's consistent across a number of different frameworks. So this list down there on the right hand side of the slide, that's some, not all, that's just a few examples of some of the places that align directly with this principle and these criteria. So this is about articulating the principles that are common to all of those different schemes and frameworks in a way that's specifically Australian. Um, I won't go into detail for the next one because I know I am short of time, but we've got one of these slides for every one of the 17 principles. And you can download this off Farm Institute's website and have a look at it in your own time. But here's where it gets sticky. When we start talking about what it is we want to measure and all the different ways this align, everybody keeps asking, where's the data coming from? How much data do we have? Where are the data gaps? And the short answer is, you tell me. That'd be great to know because that's what I'm working on at the moment with the team and it is hard. It is a really hard job. Um, it's the next stage that AFI is undertaking in, in the AASF project is to look at those measurable states and start trying to find out where we have data and where we don't. 
Uh, but there's a lot of people, not just AFI, working on this particular problem, and it's good to know that those are the people who really matter in this game. It's CSIRO, it's the Australian Bureau of Statistics, it's ABARES, it's the Department of Ag, it's all of your industry representative bodies and most of your RDCs. Every single one of them asks this question almost every day. So there's a lot of people working on this, and there is some really good initiatives underway, and I think um, some of the next speakers can talk to us more about that as well. Uh, one little bright light at the end of this long tunnel is that there's some very good work at the moment looking at how existing farm reporting systems that are used for business management can also demonstrate sustainability attributes. Because you would already know that a lot of the work that you do on farm is about sustainability. It's about improving what you've got under your management. And so if some of those systems can be used not just for your farm business, <coughs> but to demonstrate your sustainability, then it's a tell me once approach. And you're not having to do it over and over again. I'm nearly there. I was gonna talk briefly about the drivers behind why this framework has been put into play as well, but I'll skip through them very, very quickly. Again, it re relates this framework to ESG in that it's got an environmental stewardship element, looking at what climate change impacts we need to be aware of. We've got people, animals, and community, and we know that we've got different social pressures, that there's land use competition, that there are uh, animal welfare issues, other social issues that we're trying to respond to as well. And the, the governance or the economic resilience is largely related to compliance reporting. But skipping past that, really, the short story is that this is here to express the shared values that we all share, and it's been um, created not in isolation by the AFI, but in discussion with many, many different participants across agriculture over a period of three and a half years, articulating those shared values that will help us future-proof Australian agriculture so that we can keep farming into the future.